Now I'm just trying to lose this. Right, the title I was given to er for everybody is just to do a basic introduction to acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and then to talk about the history of leukemia trials. So in the introduction, this is very basic. It'll be far too basic for some of you, um, but maybe not for people who've never looked after patients with leukemia. The second half, uh, at the end of this year, we'll open a new ALL trial called All Together, the all bit standing for ALL, and it's together because it involves many European countries. Um, and I will try and briefly describe to you how 30 decades of trials, or three decades of trials, 30 years of trials, have led to the development of this trial, okay? So, first of all, the simple half. So leukemia, as you know, is an abnormal proliferation of white cells. It's a proliferation, in fact, of any stem cell. In children, it is generally acute. CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, is a fleetingly rare disease in children, a few percent. And CLL, common lymph lymphocytic leukemia, doesn't exist. So the majority of leukemias by far and away are acute, with acute lymphoblastic leukemia taking up 80 to 85 percent and AML taking about 15 to 20 percent. And if you translate that into real numbers, that means in the UK, we will see about 400 cases of ALL in a year and about 70 of, of AML. So it's very much an age-related disease. It's nicknamed childhood leukemia because it's a disease of children generally. And when we look at how we treat them, and I will say a little bit about this later, infant ALL is not a lymphoblastic leukemia, whatever it is called. It may look like a lymphoblast, but it's a stem cell disease. So we think of infant leukemia as anybody under the age of one, and they are not treated on standard ALL protocols. They're treated on international protocols of chemotherapy for their age group. However, up to in the UK from the age of one up to 24, we treat all children and young adults in more or less um, the same way, having gone through a decade where we argued were teenagers and young adults better treated on paediatric protocols or better treated on adult protocols. And I will show you that they're significantly better when treated on paediatric protocols. So it's an acute disease which needs relatively urgent treatment. So if you're not a morphologist and you're not used to looking at, um, at cells, these pinky cells are the red cells. That is the neutrophil. And these little things are platelets. And these are lymphoblasts. So these would be what you call L1 lymphoblasts. A large nucleus, very little cytoplasm, and not that much difference in size between that and uh, ordinary lymphocyte or a red cell. So the symptoms of ALL fall into two categories. One that usually brings patients to hospital, children to hospital, is really bone marrow failure. So it's the anemia, which gives them pallor, weakness, and tiredness. It's the neutropenia, and you'll all know that most of these children have been to the GP two or three times before they present with what's often upper respiratory tract infections or bleeding from thrombocytopenia. The, the, we've done, uh, pediatricians have done a startlingly good job at teaching families how to look out for meningitis. So one of the commonest reasons now that they come is when they see a petechial rash, because they've been well educated how to look for them. So generally what brings them is actually the bone marrow failure, but we do see children coming with tumor masses. So they nearly all have lymph nodes to some degree or other. They nearly all have a big liver and a big spleen. Some of them have a thymic mass in the mediastinum, and that is generally children with T-cell ALL. A lot of them come with bone pain. And when I was trained, I was always taught the phrase, beware of the limping child. And that is the two-year-old who's learned to walk and suddenly stops walking or limps. Because ch the children that age will not say, I've got a sore leg, they'll just stop walking. So the two things that give you a limping child is ALL and neuroblastoma. 
So this is the age range. We will see about 60 cases a year in Scotland. And if you look at this, the largest number is in the under fives. This is the whole of the UK. And then the five to the five to ten, nine, nines up until um, when this slide would have been made, the 16 year olds. And they would probably, so about half of them are less than five, five years of age. So how do they present? They present with signs of anemia, which is tiredness and pallor. Pallor is often a very slow thing to come on. And it's a bit like losing weight. It's somebody who hasn't seen you for a long time that notices that these children are much paler than they used to be. It's hard for parents to assess pallor because it's so gradual. They come with infections. They come with bruising or bleeding. Very few of them come with bleeding. Most of them come with petechiae and some bruising or they come with a high blast count. If the blast count is really very high, over 100,000, then they, they can get something called leukostasis, which is when these cells start clumping together and the two organ and they clot off small vessels and the two organs in a child with the smallest blood vessels going through them, which are at risk is the pulmonary capillaries and capillaries in the brain. So leukostasis affects the lungs and the brain predominantly. Or they can just have a lesser count and have infiltration of organs. So they'll have a big liver and spleen, some lymph nodes, bone pain and stop walking. A thymic mass if they've got T-cell disease and that can give strider. Or very rarely you can have infiltration of the CNS. When you get that, you're talking of 2%. So it's a very small number of children who have CNS disease at presentation. Or you can get testicular disease or skin disease. Skin lesions actually are very rare in children. They're common in babies who get infant ALL, but they're rare in children. But you can get skin deposits. So this is the thymic mass, mediastinal and widening of somebody with T-cell, sorry, T-cell ALL. Um, you know, you might say you could have that as a lymphoma, but if you see a chest X-ray like that, even if somebody's got a normal blood count, it is worth doing a bone marrow before you get NFD to start biopsying that mass, because you'll often get the answer from a, a bone marrow, which is a much safer procedure. How do we investigate them? Well, they have a blood count and a blood film. Blood films can be normal, Quite often you don't see any lower dip. It's difficult to be certain that there's any lymphoblast. So you can get leukemia with a completely normal blood count and a completely normal blood film. So we then do a marrow. We first of all take the first sample for morphology and look under the microscope. And when I started off working, that's all you could do. And you had to take your best guess were these lymphoblasts or myeloblasts. We then moved on to have what we call flow cytometry or immunophenotyping. And what that's doing is marking protein on the surface of the blasts. And you can discriminate based on those markers, what we call cell markers, between lymphoid cells and myeloid cells. And within lymphoid cells, you can see are the B cells or are the T cells. And I will show you those markers in due course. We also do cytogenetics because cytogenetics are prognostic. There are some cytogenetic groups, and I'll show you the, which they are, which they are said to carry a good outcome, and some cytogenetic abnormalities which carry a poor outcome. Up until now, we've only really looked at cytogenetic abnormalities that carry a poor outcome. For example, the 922 translocation of Philadelphia and um, positive ALL, where we've pulled these children out and treated them more aggressively. But there are other mark, other side genetics that are poor, like 1719s. So for the poor ones, they're pulled out to see do they remit and should they go to transplant. We're only in the next trial starting to use Goodrich cytogenetics. And the last test that we do is something called MRD, minimal residual disease. And minimal residual disease, just going back to see if I had a better slide to show you. I wonder if I went past it. 
minimal residual disease stands for disease that you can see down the micros that you can't see down the microscope, but you know it's there. So um, you can measure minimal residual disease in many ways. You can measure it by cytogenetics. You can measure it by fish. But how we currently measure it is by DNA. And we do it by DNA, um, as you know, B, B lymphoblasts have immunoglobulin on their surface, so they make immunoglobulin. So you get immunoglobulin rearrangements or T cells, you get T cell receptor sites. So well, that's what minimal MRD stands for, minimal residual disease. We do a lumbar puncture to look for, is there any cells in the CSF? Um, and we count the cells and we also look to see, are they blasts or are they not blasts? That will become very important in the next trial because anybody with any blast, even if it's a traumatic tap, will be upregulated to more intensive treatment. We look at all their baseline things like urea and electrolytes, liver function tests, urate. We check their chickenpox and measles antibodies in case they're subsequently exposed. And we need to know, if, do we give them IVIGG? And um, we do a coagulation screen and we do a chest X-ray to see there's no mediastinal mass. Okay. So these are, you've heard of, or maybe you've not heard of, but these are all lymphoblasts. There are, in the old days, we used to do what we call the FAB classification of lymphoblasts. That stands for French, American, British classification. And the commonest leukemia, as you see, are these L1 leukemia, ALLs, where they're big nucleuses, very little cytoplasm, small blasts about the size of a normal lymphocyte or about the size of a normal red cell. And although we don't use this prognostically, they probably are prognostically significant. These are L2s, which are much rarer, much more cytoplasm, as you can see, and you can get nucleoli in them. L3s are big cells with lots of dark blue basophilic cytoplasm and vacuoles. They're L3. This is what you see in Burkitt's lymphoma. And we no longer treat children with ALL L3 as leukemia. We treat them on a lymphoma protocol as Burkitt's M lymphoma. We've just had one of these M this weekend. So why do we do flow? Because we look at the blast down the microscope. We take our best assessment of the lymphoblasts or the myeloblasts. It's usually very easy, but it's not always easy. So we try to distinguish what type of leukemia is this by what we call their cell markers, or by flow cytometry or their immunophenotype. So it characterizes these cells by their surface or cytoplasmic features. And you can differentiate T from B by a number of um, cytoplasmic or cell markers. So B cells are all CD19, CD22 positive. T cells are all TDT and, and CD3 positive. You then can go down further, and this really is a marker of how the cells have matured. So pro-B cells are the earliest of the B lineage, and they're CD19 but CD10 negative. Common BLL, which is the vast majority of what we see, which is what you call pre precursor B um, ALL, or have acquired CD10, so they're CD10 positive. So they're there are 19 and 10 positive. We now always mark for CD22, which we didn't used to do, because there are antibodies against 19 and 22. And if patients don't respond, we want to know are those antibodies useful um, um, ther therapeutically. Pre-B of cytoplasmic immunoglobulin and B cells, mature B cells, have surface. I, I, I immunoglobulin. So that's what the markers go for. And you'll have heard people talk about cell markers, and that's to dis distinguish, to confirm their lymphoblasts and to tell if they're B or T. So it gives valuable diagnostic information. So most of these children have something wrong with their, their chromosomes, something wrong with their carrier type. Now, we all have 46 um, chromosomes, and that's your ploidy. A lot of these children have what we call hyperploidy, 
which is more than 46 chromosomes. A, a lot, many of them have high hyperploidy and hyper high hyperploidy is taken as a good prognostic indicator when they have more than 50. Hypoploidy is when you have less than 46, usually 44 or 45. High hyperploidy is if it's 40 to 45, low hyperploidy is 30 to 39. And as you know, many of them have a translocation, so a bit of one chromosome is broken off and stuck on another. And the commonest is the 12 at 21 and um, translocation. So good is hyperhyploidy. Poor is losing chromosomes. And the translocations can, um, depending on which translocation it is, can have carry prognostic significance. The favourable ones are the 1221s, the tele-ML1 and the hyperdiploid. More than 50 chromosomes and there can be any number, these can be any number of these different chromosomes. The unfavourable are the 922s, the BCR ABLES, the Philadelphia positives. They come off our trials and go on specific and either get a matinib or they get a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which targets the, the 922 translocation. And the one we're commonly using is a matinib. Sometimes um, they get desatinib. At the moment, we've got a child and we've got someone panatinib. The 1719 is very, very high risk. And some people would say it's, inc it's incurable. The IAMP21 is considered unfavorable. The 411, the, the MLL rearrangements, and very low numbers. So we are now using poor cyto, poorer cytogenetics and response to decide who goes to transplant or who gets what we'll explain are called CAR T cells. The new group of cytogenetics which has arisen is something called ABLE class fusions. So they're not the standard 922, but they will have fusions, and these are they that benefit from the addition of chemotherapy of a TKI inhibitor of a matinib. So any patient who fails to remit, these are not standard cytogenetic tests, but any patient who fails to remit at the end of day 28, we go and we screen for an ABLE-like class of fusion abnormality because that is a common commonly found in patients who fail to remit, and they're all started on imatinib. So they're prognostic, the cytogenetic abnormalities, and I think they're quite difficult for families to understand. The reason, of course, there, there is that they will all, they're, 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 they're activating genes dependent on what site, site of the chromosome they're on. So this is a rather 10-year-old, well, 15-year-old study just showing you that is the high hyperdiploid, that there are the hyperdiploid. The worst down here, I think that's the BCR, no, that is the MLL. That's the BCR ABLE. The TEL AML is up here. And the other B lineages are there. So they do make a difference as do we used to think in the current trials that MRD was everything, but are now we're realizing that there's a very strong interplay between cytogenetics and MRD. Okay, and you can see the difference in outcomes from the very good outcomes for patients with more than more chromosomes, very poor outcomes for the 411 and translocations. So what else do we do? We now, this slide was really about MRD. Lymphocytes are either B or T. Bs have immunoglobulin and are CD9, 10, 19 positive. Ts have a receptor site and will mark two, four or seven. So minimal residual disease is the amount of disease that you have left behind at any specific time point in a trial. It is dependent on how much chemotherapy you give. So if you look at trials across the world, MRD does not have the same significance um, in every trial, and the time point is not the same. And what we had to do with trials is learn what, what level of MRD mattered and at what, at, at what time point. And by what time point, I mean after how much chemotherapy. 
So minimal residual disease is a disease that you can detect, but you can't see. And although it can be done by flow, it can be done by fish. The most sensitive is molecular, and we're looking for DNA either of the immunoglobulin, a rearranged immunoglobulin, or a T cell receptor site. So patients can do one of things. They can have a fabulous response. So if you think in UCAL 2003, we used a cutoff of 10 to the minus 4. So the 10 to the minus 4 is here, negative down here. OK, but some patients will do this. Some patients will come down and they'll almost certainly go back up. So all that you can really see when you look down a microscope is that I can see one or two bad cells in 100. So having a disease level of one in 100, a response of one in 100, which you could easily have had coming down here, is very different from having a 10 to the minus four, a 0.01%. So it's one in 1,000. So there's very different, very different degrees of clearance. And the better you clear, the better you do, because the better you clear reflects the sensitivity you have to chemotherapy. So we in the UK, we look at MRD primarily, not exclusively, but primarily at the end of 28 days of chemotherapy. In our first trial, 2003, we wanted a level of 10 to the minus four. We are now stepping that up by half a log to five times 10 to the minus five. Okay, so if you want to assess it by size, cytogenetics has got a sensitivity of about 5%. It's not much better than your eye. Fish will be one to 5%. Immune phenotyping by flow, measuring the CD10, the CD19, that profile will get you down to 10 to the minus three using an IgG or a, a, a T cell receptor site will get you down to 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five. So that's really what it's saying. That's as good as you're getting with a microscope. So in our current, in our 2003, we used a cutoff of 10 to the minus four, 0.1%, um, one in a thousand cells. 2011 used 5 times 10 to the 5, 1 in 5,000 cells, 1 in 005. That, if you get below that, is a seriously better clearance, sorry, than getting to that. And looking down a microscope, we couldn't say, is a child there or is a child there? So probably MRD is the most significant predictor of outcome. And we've said that for a decade. But we are increasingly learning that you have to interplay with cytogenetics because some, trans some cytogenetics clear disease at a different kinetic rate. So they clear it quickly, much quicker than others. So for some, a slower response doesn't have the same significance. OK, so this is an acute disease. In come the parent, the patient with bone marrow failure. So neutropenic sepsis. If, if I say to you that about 98% of these children will achieve remission, or 95 might achieve remission, you say, what happens to the others? Well, as many of them will die from sepsis during induction as will fail to remit. So febrile neutropenic sepsis is extremely significant in these children. Um, particularly nowadays when the outcomes are so good. 20 years ago, when they, when they died from the disease, it did not have the same significance, but neutropenic sepsis now takes a significant death toll compared to disease alone. Dexamethasone is immensely myelo and immunosuppressive. Now, there have been on these trials a couple of children receiving dexamethasone who have died of liver failure, and they've died of liver failure from chickenpox in the liver without ever having a spot. So, you know, never, ever, ever take febrile neutropenic sepsis um, lightly. Any child with a temperature 38.5 neutropenic goes straight on to antibiotics. You can always stop them. So we give platelets, we give red cells. Bone pain is analgesia. 
So you can get signs of superior vena cable obstruction if you've got a T-cell mass or if you've got a lot of nodes, CNS disease. And the best way to shrink down masses is to give dexamethasone. They're usually immensely responsive. And you really have to do much else other than give 48, 72 hours of dexamethasone. The other problems we already talked about, these are L1 blasts or hyperviscosity. When you have a high cell count, it clogs up and it clogs up the brain and the lungs. So what do you do? Well, you want to hyperhydrate. You want to get the, the down the viscosity by increasing, by getting a good fluid load on board. Start dexamethasone as soon as you possibly can because they will shrink and accept you're going to get tumor lysis. Do not transfuse them. If you transfuse these children, only transfuse them if you absolutely have to. So we've sat with many children with hemoglobins of three and four, because if you give red cells, you're going to increase that viscosity. So try not to transfuse them um, and keep the platelet count high, because particularly in the brain, a lot of the problems is they clot to the small vessels, the vessels burst. But if you keep the platelet count high, you reduce the amount of hemorrhage that comes post the clot. Always for a child who's got a very, very high count and been very anemic, look in the retina because you often see retinal hemorrhages where they burst little vessels, particularly if they've been very anemic. So um, if once they start lysing, they'll break down the blood products and they'll get what we call tumor lysis. And what's in cells? Well, phosphate and potassium. So the phosphate goes up, it binds to the calcium, the calcium falls, but the potassium goes into the bloodstream now. Um, and that will cause renal failure and it will cause um, gout. Well, we all know what to do about that. You give them um, respiracase, if it's very, not respiracase, but respiracase. And if it's for if, if they're really, really at risk for children, all children get allopurinol for the first five days. You rarely have to give allopurinol for more than five days. And if you leave it longer than five days, they nearly all get a rash. So you just the very, very high counts get respiracase. So how do we stratify? So we have learned how to stratify over the last few decades. And we, we use the same stratification almost around the world. It came from COG. COG is the Children's on Oncology Group of the US, and they have uh, what they call an NCI stratification, the National Cancer Institute. So standard risk patient, we stratify now on age, white count, immune phenotype, and response. So um, initially, all you know or is the age and the count. So standard risk patients are patients one, to 10 years of age. And this comes from the days of trials when we didn't have MRD. We barely had cytogenetics or immune phenotyping, but we knew that young children did better than teenagers. We also knew that children with low counts did better than children with high counts. So the initial stratification comes from age and count, and the, cut the cutoff is 50,000. High count is more than 10, and white count are more than 50,000. I will say to you later, at our last trial, we learned that children with T-cell disease need anthracyclines up front. So that's why immune phenotype is now our risk stratification. Genetics, we need their cytogenetics and um, their molecular genetics if we're looking for things like BCR abel and response. The response is based on the morphology, the flow and the MRD. So in a diagnosis, in comes the child. You know the age, you know the white count. Once you've done the marrow, within your immune phenotyping has to be done straight away. It has to be done that day. So within 24 hours, you'll know if this is a B cell or a T cell. You won't know the genetics for a while. So regimen A or schedule A or whatever you want to call it is three drug induction, then Christine, dexamethasone and pegylated asparginase. So that's the young children with the low counts, the older children with the high counts, four drug induction, then Christine, dexamethasone, donorubicin and pegylated asparginase. All T cells get four drug induction. Poor responders, 
So people with bad cytogenetics, people are MRD risk or have not got down to 5 times 10 to the minus 5, MRD at the end of day 28 escalate up to regimen C because that has been shown that they benefit from more intensive treatment. So in comes a child, you do the blood test, you do the marrow, they'll have a lumbar puncture with intrathecal methotrexate. We're looking for evidence of CNS disease, but we're also putting in intrathecal methotrexate because there's a risk that we'll get a bit of bleeding into the CSF and will contaminate the CNS with leukemia blast. So the intrathecal goes in to take care of that. If there are signs of CNS disease or if there is um, any superior vena cava obstruction, then they should have a, a scan, an appropriate scan to see if there's any mass. They'll all need a line. Generally, we put ports in, but they'll either a port or a Hickman. Chemotherapy will start. Induction chemotherapy starts as soon as we've achieved that. They might be an independent of how they cope um, and whether they've had three or four drug induction. That will go on for four to six, well, it is four weeks, but it can take some time to recover and dependent on how well they will do. And we usually warn parents they could be in for that time, but hopefully they're not and they get away after a couple of weeks. All subsequent treatments, so the first bit of treatment, whether it's three drugs or four drugs, A or B, is based on age, white count, and immunophenotype. From then on, it's based on response. So the response at the end of 28 days of chemotherapy, which is a mirror of their sensitivity to chemotherapy. We will repeat the bone marrow and the lumbar puncture halfway through induction to confirm, we usually say to the mothers, to confirm that it's working. But the real truth is that we repeat that bone marrow on day 15 or day 8, dependent is in case we don't get an MRD result. MRD trumps everything. But in the old days, before MRD, we learned that children with more than 20, that with less than 25% blasts on their bone marrow on day 8, if they had four drug induction, or day 15, if they had three drug induction, did better than those who had more than 25% blast. So we would escalate those with more than 25% blast up to Schedule C. So we take this marrow just in case we do not have MRD, if we can't find an MRD marker at day 28, and we can't use that to, to monitor response. So we go back to what we did decades ago. We explain to the family what the side effects are. No treatment is given without consent and we try to explain any randomizations in the trial. And of course, we don't have a trial open yet, but we're about to have a very, very complicated trial. So basically, the first bit of treatment for simple for families is we're giving a month, 28 days of treatment to induce remission. So we have induction treatment to reduce, induce a remission. You know, there's only a very small percentage of children don't achieve remission. If you say 95% won't, well, half of those won't get into remission and half of those will die from sepsis in the first 28 days. The rest of the treatment is given to consolidate that remission. Even if we can't see disease, we know that it's there. So everybody gets consolidation, which is mainly based at treating the CNS or preventing any CNS treatment. Everybody gets a block of delayed intensification and everybody gets maintenance, sorry. But how intensive that is depends entirely on your response at the end of day 28. OK, so this is kind of UCAL 11. It's, so you start off an ARB, ARB, assuming that you respond well and get MRD negative, you get consolidation, you get some kind of maintenance, interim maintenance, which on this trial was either standard interim maintenance or hydrous methotrexate. You get delayed intensification, you get maintenance with pulses. If you don't clear your MRD or you've got bad cytogenetics, you get augmented consolidation, you get more intensive interim maintenance, you get DI and you go on to get maintenance. So you escalate up to C. Nobody goes from A to B. You start off in A, A, and, A and B and then you escalate up to C. And both A and B will escalate to C. 
So um, I'm just going to come out of that and ask, is there any questions you'd like to ask me before I do the clinical trials? Yes, uh, Daniel Hoffman's got a couple of questions. Okay. Do you want to mute, Daniel? I'm not going to look at you, Danielle, because if I lose this, I'm in, I'm IT illiterate and I'll never get back in. Uh, uh, Albert's answered one of the questions. It was just uh, just clarifying where the MRD comes from, and it's from the from the biopsy, from the bone marrow biopsy. From the bone marrow. Yes. yes. You and can get MRD from the blood if yeah. you have a high enough count, but the bone marrow is a better source. Sure. And then the other question. So you you mentioned about retinal hemorrhages. I was just interested to hear. Does that change anything that you do in that initial no. management? No. Right. No, it's it's a combination of a high count bleeding. And if you're very anemic, I think even very anemic people can get retinal hemorrhages. Sure. But and they generally improve. You're just terribly unlucky if you get them in a bad place. But by and large, the eyesight returns to normal. OK. But if we see that, you know, we do always ask the eye people just to come along and make certain that you know they're not worrisome. Sure. I just wondered if it changed what you would do in terms of the amount of fluid or how cautious you are. But oh. What would I just keep that platelet count up? Yeah, yeah. Just keep the platelet count high. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Was that clear enough? Silence. Okay. He is Sorry. nodding. Okay. He is nodding. Okay. Okay. So I will go on to the, do the trials, and this is a. So what I'm trying to do here is show you how we've got from where we started and old as I am, I don't remember all of this. I didn't live through all of this to where we are now. So this is serial trials and ALL trials have always been called UCAL, UCAL United Kingdom Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia. So these trials are from UCAL 8 and UCAL 8 was ran between 1980 and 85, had with the outcome of this is an overall survival. The disease-free survival was only 55%. So this is an overall survival. So for, I should have, I did have a slide, I don't know where it went, but an overall survival means that you get the disease and you're alive five years or 15 years later. Even if you've relapsed and had a transplant, and that's the reason you're alive, alive you're included in that curve. A disease-free survival means that you've remitted and you're alive and the disease has never relapsed. So a disease-free survival will always be inferior to an overall survival. Generally, we use event-free survivals, and an event is failing to remit, relapsing, or dying from infection. So generally we use event-free um, nowadays, but you can see that even with overall survival, we've gone from 64, we've gained 30% improvement. And that is a very, so there's very, very few diseases, cancers out there that are improved by 30% in what is 40 years. So how have we done it? Well, the first trials in ALL started in 1960, nobody survived. This disease was 100% fatal. You could get, they had things like 6MP, they could get people into remission, but they couldn't hold a remission. We didn't have any fancy diet, there weren't any fancy diagnostic tests. You had morphology. If nobody survived, you don't need to risk group stratify because everybody's getting what you've got. We've got to a level now where for everybody, the overall survival is about 90%. If you take the best players, it's about 98%. We now can diagnose with morphology, immune phenotype, and know what kind of leukemia it is. And we can stratify by age, white count, genetics, and response. And the next trial, we are learning to, to have different levels of MRD dependent on the cytogenetic group, because they do interplay. So even up until now, we've, we're becoming less crude. So what has been the best advantage of clinical trials? Now, in my day, people used to say that you're better on a trial than off a trial. It doesn't matter how good that trial is um, because trials bring discipline. 
So what we did used to initially do, initially, trials were aimed at, they brought uniformity and they were aimed at getting a cure. And that's still what happens, but with time. When you, if you can cure somebody with a 98 to 90% chance, it becomes increasingly important what kind of person, what kind of side effects they have. So they have swung around between desperately trying to cure anybody to tailoring treatment, stratifying, so you can tailor treatment to reduce side effects for those children who are going to do very well. And over the history of these trials, we have pulled off. Initially, we gave everything and laterally we pull off. And all trials now are aimed at identifying the really bad players and taking them to transplant or a car and identifying the really good players and reducing their treatment to minimize the side effect. So the whole ethos has swung. So you're trying to reduce relapse and treatment related side effects. I'm not very good at this. And either do that in those with a, with a low risk of relapse whilst intensifying, bringing in antibody, a CAR T cell and a transplant to those who are at high risk of relapse. So how did we do this? Because it is the success story of cancer. Well, the first thing we did a by national and international collaboration. So many, the next trial will, I can't remember how many countries, but you will get told that it's us, the French, the Scandinavians, the Dutch, and there's a lot of countries in it. And that is a move. One advantage that ALL has had over every other leukemia, every other cancer of children is, is common. So if you've got 400 cases, you can afford to run a UK-wide trial. If you've only got 70 cases of AML, it is very difficult to get power to ask any questions. So we've done it by when things have not been good, by looking around the world and adopting and adapting other people's successes. We've learned to engage with science, we've engaged with cytogenetics, we've engaged with my molecular biology. The molecular biologists are the people who do the MRD. And we've learned to run randomized controlled clinical trials asking relevant questions. The first trials opened in the 70s and they standardized treatment. The principle of a clinical trial is always you have a control arm, which is the best arm of the previous trial, and then you compare that with an experimental treatment, which becomes the experimental arm. So you've got standard versus new. And we should never forget the influence, how important the funders of these trials are. These trials may be a pain in the butt to us, um, but they are, these trials cost vast sums of money to run. The MRD that tagged on to UCAL 2003 came from the LRF, which is now called Bloodwise, or children with cancer, in the children with leukemia, which was a sub-branch, and they gave us six million pounds to run that MRD. So, you know, these are very, these charities um, and clinical trials units are very, very important. We could not run, we could not do the stats, the, stat, the statistics without clinical trials units. So I think there have been four UK trials which has framed what we now do. So we have interacted internationally. So the first of the important ones came in, in, 2000, uh, in, in 1980. At that time, the UK were very poor players. They were recognised as having results. They were unable to reduce the outcomes for children with leukaemia that the US could produce. So we, adopt, we adapted or adopted the US, the C, the, before they were called COG, they were called the CCSG. We adopted their current trial, which gave in remission and in, 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 in remission induction, with Christine like we do, prednisolone, which is a very inferior steroid to dexamethasone. And we gave something called E. coli asparginase. Pegylated asparginase is made of a winnier asparginase, and E. coli was a very poor asparginase. So the reason I'm stressing this is we gave minimal chemotherapy to these children. They then had their heads irradiated, and they'd intrathecal methotrexate um, during their cranial radiation. They had maintenance. So no delayed intensification, no intensification. 
But what that trial brought was rigid compliance, and it brought septum as PCP prophylaxis. So for the first time, the UK all agreed what they would do, and they all did it. Previously, they'd all done what they liked before, and that's why they were so unsuccessful. So the disease-free survival, I showed you the overall survival was 64%. The disease-free survival was 55%. So that is 15 to 20% better than anything we'd ever achieved in the UK before. The, that became the backbone of all future trials, induction, consolidation, and maintenance. We didn't know it at that time, or it wasn't known at that time, but, but by, the, by the end of the decade, by 2003, we looked back and said, 55% of these children were cured with next to no chemotherapy and they never relapsed. So although over the next 20 years, we had escalated and escalated and escalated chemotherapy, we knew that half of those children could be cured on next to no treatment. And that is what gave the, the investigators of UCAL 2003 the courage to reduce treatment. And that's actually very hard to reduce treatment and very hard to get parents to agree to a randomization to reduce treatment. We didn't collect DNA, but had we collected the DNA on these children, they would have almost certainly been the children who were MRD negative at the end of induction. So we could look back in 2003 and say, next to nothing cured half of these children, and it's safe to reduce treatment, and we could have bet that we could select the ones out to reduce treatment by saying, well, let us reduce the treatment for the MRD negative children, because we were doing MRD by 2003, because they're likely to have been the ones that survived in, in, in 1980. So I hope you understand that. I'm just really trying to say half of these kids can be cured with next to nothing. And you can probably identify that half by MRD. So along came UCAL 9 was an adult trial. UCAL 10 is here, and it was an unsuccessful trial. You will see we increased, we gave two blocks of intensification. What we did with our two blocks of intensification was we gave whackingly intensive treatment for five days, then we waited for the count to come back up. You'll see nobody else in the world did that. The Germans had prolonged intensification, the Americans had prolonged intensification. And we learned that children on AML need a little bit of treatment all the time. If you think of delayed intensification now, it's weekly. It's not five days and wait three weeks for the count to come back. You're hitting them all the time. So next came UCAL 11. By this time, we had learned to stratify like the Americans, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute Stratification, Age and Count. And in this trial, we decided to test CNS modalities of treatment for the central nervous system. We had traditionally irradiated the head, not in the UK, but in America. They had also irradiated the head, but they'd stopped doing it. And at this stage, parents were suing hospitals whose children couldn't get into Ivy League universities because of the intellect, because of the psychometric damage done by cranial radiation. So we're all looking at a ways of withdrawing the radiation. And what we did was, and for children with regimen A, so low count, young age, low risk, we randomized them between intrathecal chemotherapy alone throughout maintenance or blocks of high dose methotrexate. For those with regimen B, which was a smaller number and at higher risk, we were more worried about CNS disease there, we randomized them between high-dose methotrexate and cranial irradiation. The outcome of that trial was high-dose methotrexate and cranial irradiation reduced the risk of CNS relapse compared to intrathecal methotrexate, but the event-free survival was the same because we got more marrow relapses, non-CNS relapses. So there was really no advantage from that trial of cranial irradiation and it's been abandoned. So we have not irradiated since then. 
It does produce learning difficulties. It's also associated with brain tumors, probably in protocols that give a lot of VP16, which is a radio sensitizer. But this trial led to us abandoning cranial irradiation. Why did we see bone, more bone marrow relapses? We probably overrescued them with folinic acid. So that was the, the trial that brought in uh, intrathecal method, made intrathecal methotrexate the standard, which most of you know of it as the standard, but also introduced high dose methotrexate to the UK and lost cranial irradiation. The other, the other thing that we did was what I've already told you. We looked at the bone marrows at day eight or 15, depending on whether or not there were three or four drug induction, took a cutoff of 25%, and you can see there was a significant advantage for clearing disease down to 25% blasts by uh, during induction. And that then became standard practice to look at the marrow at day eight and day 15. So the next trials that came were called ALL 97 and 99, and they ran for those five years. They were the predecessors to ALL 2003. So again, the UK had slipped behind and our outcomes were 10% behind the US for event-free survival, not for overall survival. We were salvaging the children, but it was at the cost of a transplant and you really want to stop people relapsing. We adopted their, CC, their COG um, risk criteria, A and B, and we introduced regimen C as they had a regimen C. We looked at response at day 25, at AR 8 or 15. We improved our asparginase. We got rid of E. coli. We adopted Erwinie. Um, and um, we then looked at the steroid. We randomized pregnisolone up against dexamethasone in induction and in pulses. And dexamethasone significantly reduced the risk of both systemic and CNS relapse. So this is how we arrived at dexamethasone. During maintenance, we compared 6-MP with 6-thiguanine and we'd used 6-thiguanine before. 6-thiguanine was actually more effective at preventing CNS relapse, but it was not overall survival. And it was uh, we had about 11% incidence of uh, venous thrombosis of the liver. So that is how we get 6 mercaptopurine and not 6 thiguanine during maintenance. So both 6-MP and dexamethasone were brought forward. So then we got to ALL 2003. So from previous trials, we'd adopted the, N the INCI for risk stratification, age, and count. We had taken the... RER means rapid early responder, less than 25% blast by day 15 for the intermediate ones by day eight. So we'd adopted, uh, we were using that as MRD or as, as response. And for the first time, we did MRD at day 28. When we started off, we were nervous and we checked it at day 11, which, at week 11, which we no longer do. We want, we knew that half of these children um, and the same for regimen B, could get by with a, a friction of the treatment we were given. So we randomized those who were MRD negative, and at this trial it was 10 to the minus four to one versus two blocks of delayed intensification. If you were high risk by cytogenetics, you automatically got regimen C, or if you were a slow responder, so more than 25% blast, you got C. If you were um, MRD positive, you were randomized between A and C. Sorry. Um, and that is kind of the proportions of patients that fell into this. So what was the outcome? The question was, can you reduce the amount of chemotherapy you give to MRD negative children as we believed we had learned from UCAL-8? So this is... Um, Event-free survival. One, the dotted line is one block of delayed intensification. The solid line is two, no difference. The relapse risk, 
the dotted line is two, the solid line, uh, sorry, the solid line is two, the dotted line is one, no difference. So there was no advantage to giving two blocks of delayed intensification, which is why the children now all get one block of delayed intensification. And we showed with time, there was no advantage to giving it to people who were MRD positive or high risk either. So that was the answer to the first question. The second question, it wasn't really a question, was could you use MRD to risk stratify patients? So this is low risk, MRD negative, event free survival, 95%, relapse risk, 3.7%, overall survival, 98%. So if you have a child who is MRD negative, at the end of induction, day 28, you can say to the parents, the relapse risk is less than 5%. And that's a great thing to be able to say um, to parents. If you're MRD positive, so more than in this trial, more than 10 to the 4, more than 1 in 1,000 cells, the overall survival was 84%. The event-free survival was 78 So not as good. But compared to many cancers, not that bad. Um, you know, an 84% overall survival, even if that is salvage from trans, and that's not much salvage. That's a 5% difference. A lot of people would kill for a 17% re relapse risk. So, you know, this is the really important thing that MRD negative children have a very, very low risk of relapse. So, how does white count? and age interplay. So if you look at these lines, MRD low, MRD low in the green, it doesn't matter if your standard risk, so young with a low count or high, older with a high count, your outcome 96, 94, relapse 30, 3.8, 3.3. So for, MR, for MRD um, negative, MRD low risk patients, MRD trumps age and count. The age and count are not significant. <coughs> they lose their significance. However, if you're MRD positive, high risk, um, and your standard risk, so young with a low count, event-free survival is 87% up against 71. So for a high for older children, high count, there is an interplay between MRD status and um, age and if you're if you're MRD positive, your age and your count does matter. But not if you're low risk MRD, not, not if you're your low risk MRD, but it does matter. Age and count does influence, have an influence for high risk MRD. So by 2011, which is the trial most of you will know, I do forget how young most of you are. We were using NCRI criteria. We had accepted that MRD stratified treatment was what we might call standard of care. Um, we were intensifying event-free survival and intensification had improved. Giving regimen C had improved event-free survival in MRD positive patients. And we were confident we could reduce treatment in MRD negative patients because they still had an excellent outcome. There was no advantage to two blocks of delayed intensification. The other thing we learned, we had learned, um, traditionally children, uh, people's teenagers had been treated on adult trials and adult trials were dominated by transplant. But um, in the 16 to 24 age group, they joined at UCAL 2003, which had no transplant arm and the event-free survival was improved by 20%. So they show, we showed, that they were better off treated as children than treated as adults. So now in the UK, we treat people up to the age of 24. In some countries, they're treating them up to 40. And the basic difference between adults and children protocols are there's little or no transplant in a pediatric protocol and a lot of transplant in an adult protocol. The one thing that the adults, you have to say in their defense is they have a lot of Philadelphia positive ALL, but that's removed from these trials. So the event-free survival by age in UCAL 2003 was 89% for children less than 10, 82 for 10 to 15 and 74. So age did matter. And we accepted that dexamethasone reduced relapses by about 33%, but it's very toxic. 
and that was one of the questions addressed in 2011. Cranial radiation is gone even for CNS3, so for frank disease it's not used. We were questioning the value of increasing and dexamethasone in maintenance because some trials said it had no benefit. So that is how 2011 opened, asking questions about steroid, which was very toxic, and um, asking questions about the CNS. And the reason for that was, if you look at children in 2000 uh, across the world, this is the Italians, this is the Americans. Their overall survival, 98 to 99% for them all. TRM, about 1%. So you ask, like, if your overall survival is 98% and your treatment-related mortality is 1%, you're as likely to die from treatment as you are from disease. So that tells you you have to get down the toxicity, particularly for that group of patients. The other thing that we learned from 2011 from doing MRD, these are MRD positive, these are MRD negative. The marrow relapsed much lower in MRD negative patients. Of the, of the total marrow relapses, you know, a third of them, you know, a third compared to that. But if you look at CNS, there was no difference in the number of CNS relapses based on the MRD. So MRD does not predict for CNS relapse. It predicts for marrow relapse, but not CNS relapse. And the reason that everybody hates dexamethasone, despite it's good, I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen a Fisher plot, but Fisher plots, um, if the square is to this side, that treatment's best. If the square is to that side, that. So for disease, for a CNS relapse, marrow relapse, any event in death, dexamethasone was superior to prednisolone, except for deaths in remission, where they were much higher in the dexamethasone arm. So that was the rationale for 2011. We stuck with the NCI stratification. We saw that the relapse-free survival was actually good for T-cells. We had identified poor as cytogenetics. We increased the MRD level to 5 times 10 to the minus 5, or 1 to 5,000 cells. We checked again at week 14, um, because if you were more than 0.5, you're a poor responder and you came off treatment. One de de delayed intensification. We stuck with dexamethasone, and we really did think a lot, should we go back to PRED because of the toxicity? But we looked at a randomization and induction of 14 days of 10 milligrams up against 28 days of 6 milligrams. The TRM for that trial overall was, was 3.2, and that's far too high a TRM for disease-free survival of 87%. And most of the TRM, the deaths were induction and delayed intensification. So if you're, if you're old enough to remember the, the randomization and induction for UCAL 2011, was 14 days of dex, high dose dexamethasone versus 28 days at six milligrams. There was no advantage, and um, the stats on that are not yet published, but um, there was concern. Some patients did worse on 14 days, higher dose, some did better. Inconclusive, the statisticians say you'll never prove advantage um, or disadvantage, so that randomization was abandoned. The other great concern, apart from sepsis, for dexamethasone is avascular necrosis. The other question that was asked in this trial, because of the concerns of CNS relapse, um, far outweighing for low-risk patients and um, bone marrow relapse, we, start, we looked at different modalities of CNS treatment. We had given intrathecal chemotherapy. The, and we've done what America does. Britain always sides with the Americans, politically and in every other way. So um, the Europe, we're giving high-dose methotrexate, no intrathecal methotrexate after high-dose methotrexate. In the UK, we were giving, along the Americans, either capizzi-type moderate into maintenance for a regimen C or intrathecal for the others. So um, there's a relatively high incidence, about 4%, and it makes up about 50% of the total relapses. So it's low numbers, it is relatively 
group important, and it's not predicted for by MRD. So we randomized methotrexate up against intrathecal methotrexate. We also randomized vincristine dexamethasone pulses because of the morbidity. So we ended up, we should have had hydros methotrexate versus intra maintenance or capizi plus methotrexate pulses versus no pulses, but the statisticians wouldn't take that. So we ended up with intermediate or capizi maintenance, which is what regimen um, A, uh, A, B, and C get, plus pulses versus. The same with no pulses, high dose methotrexate pulses, high dose methotrexate no pulses. Now the hard randomization to cell was no pulses and no high dose methotrexate. This randomization has not yet reported, but it was a four-way randomization of high dose methotrexate versus no high dose methotrexate pulses versus no pulses. So that took us, that has taken us to where we now are. We're about to do all together. Um, at the moment, high dose methotrexate is in there. If this trial reports no advantage, it may come out. So the special categories of the Down syndrome, high TRM. The outcome for Down syndrome ALL is not any better than for non-Downs. It's not like AML where they do much better. High, high TRM. So um, they all get regimen A, irrespective of whether they have a high count of their age. And the only ones who get anthracycline during induction or go to, uh, to regimen C are those who have slow early responders on day 15, and it goes in at day 15. They're not eligible for high dose methotrexate, and, the, and it may be within time. Down syndromes who are slow early responders and who would have intensification of chemotherapy We'll get blinitunumab, which is a CD19 antibody, and it's targeted, so it should be much less toxic. But Down syndrome, you need to reduce the toxicity. They all get superfloxacin and prophylaxis. And of course, Philadelphia positive ALL will come out and get um, chemotherapy plus a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So sadly, the drugs that do the best which is dexamethasone and pegylated asparginase causes all the problems. Infection I've spoken about with dexa. And Christine, you probably know about with its neuropathy, which is a big issue in teenagers. The big problems with asparginase is thrombosis and pancreatitis. Thrombosis tends to be age-related. Methotrexate, mucositis and encephalopathy. Steroids, infection, diabetes, avascular necrosis. And then there's all the psychology problems. So the other thing we learned from 2003, this is the incidence of avascular necrosis, far commoner in females than males. And you can see very, if you're less than 10, it's almost unheard of, and it increases with age. So it's the teenagers. There's the 10 year olds. 10% of them, only about 10% get symptoms. Some countries MRI everybody, and about 75% of people have MRI changes. So that's a bit of a waste of time because you're not going to do much about it. Um, but some get very severe symptoms and go on to get joint um, replacement. And we have had children who have said the AVN is worse than the leukemia. Dex, in the next trial, we will look for um, silent inactivation of asparginase. And um, although we blame asparginase for the thrombosis and lots of the problems, they interact. De asparginase and dexamethasone are very, very important drugs, but you clear dexamethasone slower as you get older. So there is age related, that's why you see age related toxicities. Um, asparginase lowers your albumin and that reduces your clearance of dexamethasone. So there is an interplay between asparginase and dexamethasone. And in the next trial, we will be measuring asparginase antibodies because about 15% of patients get silent inactivation and are in fact receiving no asparginase. So I'm just finishing off now. So what is the way forward for the next trial? Well, a better understanding of the biology, particularly how they interact. The use of bite antibodies, so bispecific T-cell engineered antibodies, blinitunumab against 19 CD3, 
Inatunumab against 22. Inatunumab is in altogether. TKI inhibitors for the ABLE-like fusions. For those, you know, we now know who's a bad responder who won't even respond to transplant. And they will go for CAR T cells, chimeric antigen receptor T cells. They have very good CNS penetration. So they all not only get marrow, but they get CNS disease. They are complicated by this thing called CRS, a cytokinase release syndrome. This is just a bite, which is just an engineered antibody against your own, against a tumor cell. And this is ALL 2011. 2000 altogether, ALL altogether, there'll be 1,400 patients from 14 countries, age up to 45, but not for the UK. They'll be stratified to reduce chemotherapy in the good responders, particularly getting rid of steroids and anthracyclines, novel agents for the poor players, um, and for anti